شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling us to meet today again to further discuss our topic on tribalism and the implications uh, on security. Hospital Emina Shaitan Rajim. Yeah, you are not in a lakina coming Zakari wa Unsa, which I'm not Kosuba Wakaba Ila, Ita Rafu. In a gramaco in the la at the cock. In the la alimun habir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed mankind, humanity generally, not just Muslims, not the people of the book, but humanity generally. Oh mankind, we create you from a single peer of a male and female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Fairly, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous of you and Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. This is Surah to Hujurat, Ayah 13, the 13th verse. We have discussed the meaning and the Islamic perspective of tribalism. Today, I want to call our attention to the dangers of tribalism. We often assume that it is very easy. All we need to do is, let's just break it up. And individuals, the, the different groups will just go their way. It is never that easy. Always remember, there was a time we thought that once you mention the North, you are thinking of the Hausa Fulani. We make it look like the Hausas, the Fulanis, they are the same people. We just say the Hausa Fulani of the North. Now we know better. It is never like that. It was never like that. We now realize that in the North, you have the Hausas, you have the Fulanis, you have Udoma, the Tif, the Berum, the Bachama, and so on and so forth. You have so many pockets of tribes <coughs> scattered all over the north. Even within what you call the houses, by the time you go to tribalism, you will start to understand the difference between the Kanawa and the Saki Saki. The Kanawas are the ones from Kano. The Sakisakis are the ones from Zaria. And then you start to understand the difference between these two and the ones from Sokoto. What does this portend? It opens our fault lines. It shows the cliff edges that have become blood when they are waking them. We make them become predominant in our discourse. In the West, it's just enough for all of us to claim that we are the sons and daughters of Odudua. Fine. Very easy to say. But when the chips are down, when we cling to tribalism, you will come to know the difference between Jebu and Egba. You come to know that there was a place you used to call Egbado. Today, if they are called them Egbado, you'll be in trouble. They are now Yewa. That is what the politics of tribalism does to us. It will open cliff edges. You will start to understand the buried histories. I use the word the buried histories because for every student of history, we must come to understand one thing. Most of what we learn is what we call the official history, the documented fashion. The fact is there are other fashions. Interestingly, some of these other fashions may be more factual than what we have learned 
Take for example, we all learned in history, Mungo Park discovered River Niger. For anybody at my, of, of my age, this was what we learned in primary school, in secondary school. If you are going to question that thought, you must have reached the university. Before you started questioning it, you start asking yourself, Mungo Park discovered River Niger, and he met human beings fishing on River Niger. What happened to those human beings? They, they never knew it was a river, yet they were fishing on it. So what did Mungo, Mungo Park discover? In reality, the official history we were taught then, we have come to realize the incorrectness of that history. Mungo Park, of course, discovered River Niger for Europe. Europe never knew River Niger existed. So this is what I mean by official history, what was documented. But the reality is Mungo Park never discovered River Niger for us. We knew the river was there. Our fathers were fishing on River Niger. So Mungo Park could never have come to discover it. But so when you open your fourth lines, these are the kind of things that will not be coming up, even in your, in your own environment. These are the things you'll be realizing. You are now going to realize, for example, that in a town like Sagamu, in Sagamu, you have so many others. I was reading a document recently, which dated back to around 1830-something, where the grand obas of Yoruba land were listed. There was an oba in Maku. Today, Maku is subsumed in Shagamu. So by the time you open these cliffages, what you are going to be bringing is more and more crisis. Because everybody wants to claim independence from the other. And therefore, we become scattered. And again, tribalism will give you a sense of arrogance. When you, are, when you segregate yourself from others, you feel that you are better than them. They are depending on you. They are living on you. So you want to take yourself away from them. This is never correct. You look down on people. I remember those days when we were young. There used to be one joke. They said there was an accident. Hope nobody died. They said nobody died. Then when they were discussing, they said, one Gabari, one Gabari died. And people were asking, eh, what about that Gambari? He's not a human being. That is the kind of mentality that tribalism does to people. I was listening to another man, Atobalende. He was accusing the Yorubas generally that they were cowards. Cowards. And I took time to listen to him. He said they were cowards. That's why they avoided the civil war. And I look at this man. He has forgotten that the Yorubas eventually received the surrendering flag from the Easterners. So this is the danger of what tribalism does to us. Another problem of tribalism is what the psychologists or the sociologists call generalization. The crime of one man becomes the crime of his tribe. If a Fulani man commits a crime, all Fulanis will bear the body of that crime. If a Yoruba man commits a crime, all Yorubas will bear the body of that crime. If an Alza man commits a crime, an Igbo man commits a crime, all the Igbos will bear the body of that crime. This is what tribalism does to us. Invariably, you live in a house where you have an able man who is honest, who relates with you peacefully, who does not quarrel with you. But because you have seen an able man who defrauded you, you want to believe that you cannot relate with any able man when it comes to money. This is wrong. Because you have seen an, a, a full animal who you wanted to fight with and he drew out his dagger, you believe every full animal is bloodthirsty. This is wrong. This is a very, very wrong perspective. This is the problem of tribalism. Tribalism blinds our sense of reasoning. 
it makes our listening go awkward. I do remember a few years back, there was a battle between two different communities, the Aguleri and the Umuleri in the east. These were two different towns, separated only by a single road. By a single road that came between them. And they fought so much that they started killing themselves. They had intermarriage. Some will kill the, the, the wife if you are an Aguleri man and your brother is married to an Umuleri uh, woman. You kill the woman, you throw the corpse on the road towards the other side so that they will pick it. And the Umuleri too will look at the woman who is Aguleri from their own, they will kill. Some they will kill and kill the children. This is a wobble mentality. It's a product of bad thinking. Again, I want all of us to know, apart from opening our fault lines, we must all remember we are all migrants. We all moved from one place to the other. We conquered and we were conquered. I remember reading the history of, of Obomosho, and I realized the Shon came to help a people. The people were in existence, about seven different communities. How will you feel if those communities rise up today and tell our father, the Shon, go back to where we come from? We want to take over our town. Is that logical? Is that reasonable? It is not. That's not the kind of thing we should encourage. But when we go down the rope of tribalism, that is where we are going to get to. We'll be recalling dead history. We'll be abusing ourselves. We'll be fighting. And the unfortunate aspect of this, who will be the beneficiaries? The common man who will be used as foot soldier, the old do a talker talker. The students of Danford deal. The outside man to the core, they are not the ones at all. They will not benefit from this. Let me recall an incident when Abiola died. Abiola was a politician who won an election, which the military under Babangida counseled. Abiola was imprisoned and he died in, in, in the prison. What did we do? The Yorubas, those of us in the Southwest, we rallied and we started attacking all people we know from the North. Most of the people we attacked were petty traders who were suffering like ourselves. And in retaliation, in Kano, Southerners were being attacked. Who were they being attacked? Also common men. The people who are benefiting from our political misadventure, you will never be able to attack them. Rather, they will buy you a weapon to kill yourselves. They give you, they'll give you hemp to smoke to kill yourselves. Their children will never be at home with you. No, they won't participate in that barbarism. You will never be able to see them while you do all this. You open the fault lines, they benefit. When you have killed yourselves, they come back with their children. They want to be president. Their children will become governor. Their political thugs will become your liberators, who you continue to hail and follow up all and down, thinking that you are liberating yourselves. No. You have only changed the lordship from those you think who are oppressing you to their colleagues who are your own men, who speak your language, who have the same culture with you, that's what tribalism will do to you. It does not bring you anything better. So what we should all understand, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us, is that these tribes are there for us to know ourselves, to understand ourselves. Little Arafu, so that you can know yourselves, understand yourselves. We know our different cultures, we understand them and we lead ourselves on their basis. It should not be the basis by which we now fight. The dangers are very clear. The fault lines, once they are opened, 
it becomes very, very easy. The enemy that cannot attack Nigeria because it's big will find it very easy to attack an Egba state, to attack an Egomina state. Because it will be very small. Where is the resources in the first place to build that state? All this, you have not even looked at. It becomes very easy. You become an easy prey in the hand of your enemy, who in the first place is encouraging you to go ahead. Fight. Remember South Sudan. What has become of South Sudan? Any peace there today? No. They have eliminated what they consider to be their common enemy. What was the common enemy? Northern Sudan, the Arabs. They were eliminated. Now, rule yourselves. The different groups. Again, he started identifying their fault lines. Different tribes, different ethnic groups started coming together. It is now like the hen has passed on the rope. Neither the rope nor the hen can rest. That is what tribalism does to people. That's what it does to a community. We must, therefore, work to ensure that we sustain ourselves as we are. Call to other what is wrong. Blur the fault lines and ensure that we all come together to make our nation better. Inshallah, we continue again tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.